Welcome once again to explore ecstatic sensuality. If one were to do an experiment on word association, particularly with subjects who have an interest in what used to be called New Age thought and Eastern religions and esotericism in general, the word Tantra would instantly call to mind the word sex, and for many, vice versa. So, I imagine that many of my listeners will be intrigued by today's topic. Ancient Tantric sex rituals, women in Tantra, and the concept of a creator god in Buddhism. Just to tantalize you a bit, I am going to be presenting some ancient Sanskrit texts which give explicit instructions as to how to engage in sexual activities. Some of the texts which I have translated will be presented here for the first time in any podcast, or for that matter, in any readily available source. I am going to take as a jumping-off point some work of Patton Burchett, done at Indiana University Bloomington. He is now a professor at Columbia University in New York, myself, and others. Let us take as a starting-out point tantric traditions within Hinduism, their origin, their development over time, and so forth. First, let us consider two scholarly definitions of Tantra and of Tantric. The first is by David Gordon White. Tantra is that Asian body of beliefs and practices which, working from the principle that the universe we experience is nothing other than the concrete manifestation of the divine energy of the Godhead that creates and maintains that universe, seeks to ritually appropriate and channel that energy within the human microcosm in creative and emancipatory ways. The phrase channeling energy in creative and emancipatory ways is also one of the major themes of the Explore Ecstatic Sensuality podcast. More specifically, Douglas Renfrew Brooks has provided nine criteria for what constitutes tantric practices, at least within the context of Hinduism. 1. It is extra-Vedic, i.e., outside the conventional canon of Hindu scripture. 2. It involves special forms of physical discipline such as kundalini yoga. 3. It is both theistic and non-dualistic. 4. It involves elaborate speculation on the nature of sound and the ritual use of mantras. 5. It utilizes symbolic diagrams such as yantras and mandalas. 6. It places great emphasis on the authority of the guru. 7. It employs the bipolar, gendered sexual, symbolism of God and goddess. 8. Its teachings are, at least partially, secret. 9. It involves transgressive practices and the use of conventionally prohibited substances. More on that later. And 10, it requires special forms of initiation in which caste and gender are not primary qualifications. We would like to suggest also race in our present context. Abhinava Gupta was born in Kashmir in the mid-10th century, 950 to 960 AD. But first, we must say a sentence or two about Trika Shaivism, the Kapalikas, and the Yogini cults, which form the background of his thoughts. As a reminder, Shaivism is, in Hinduism, the worship of Shiva as the supreme being. In some traditions of Shaivism, the approach to Shiva can only be achieved through the goddess Shakti. This was, in fact, a tantric tradition. Bhairava Shiva, a terrifying form of Shiva, together with his consort, the goddess, was considered the leader of a horde of dangerous, powerful, and bloodthirsty female deities known as the Yoginis. A male practitioner could be initiated into the clan, Kula, of one of the multiple, often eight, mother goddesses from whom these, often sixty-four, yoginis emanated. These semi-divine yoginis were thought to possess and become incarnate in certain women, 
also known as yoginis, who were considered to be their human counterparts and embodiments. The yoginis of the Kaula and Tantric traditions were at once regarded as flesh and blood women with whom male practitioners interacted and as the devouring semi-divine beings who were the object of their worship cult. It was only through these women, who were his clan sisters and spiritual superiors, that the male initiate could attain the supernatural powers and enjoyments he sought. I mention this because so much of this ancient tantric literature, including the works of Abhinavagupta, which we will be discussing here, is clearly directed toward male practitioners. While the female concert plays a vital role in the ritual, traditionally the Kuliyaga seems to have been directed toward and performed primarily for the benefit of men. On the subject of women in Tantra, we will have a great deal more to say later. To put Abhinava Gupta into intellectual and historical context, and also into the context of one of the major themes of this podcast, he was a member of the Trika Kaula lineage and provided the definitive formulation of its non-dualistic doctrines. Opposed to and in direct competition with Abhinavagupta's Trika school was the dualistic Shaiva Sihanta tradition. By the 10th century, the Shaiva scene in Kashmir, where Abhinavagupta lived, was dominated by the confrontation of these two radically opposed schools. The Shaiva Siddhanta, with its idealistic and monistic ontology and soteriology, asserted that the world and individual souls are real entities and that final release depends on the grace of Shiva. In opposition to the non-dualism of the Trikakala school, the Shaiva Siddhanta maintained a strict separation between matter and consciousness as well as between Shiva and the practitioner. This more conservative Shaiva tradition followed Brahmanic orthodoxy, conformed to caste restrictions, de-emphasized feminine power, Shakti, and shunned transgressive ritual practices. The Trika Kala competed for the allegiance of Shaiva households in an entirely different fashion. While conforming to caste purity and ritual orthodoxy in public, they offered access to liberation and spiritual enjoyments through initiation into the esoteric ritual practices of secretive tantric cults. Now, dualism as a way of looking at existence, at the universe, can be traced in Western thought all the way back to the Greek philosopher Plato, whose views we undertook to outline in our very first episode, and became further enshrined in the Western philosophical tradition by René Descartes and others. Employing the broadest possible strokes, dualism results in an attitude that not only are the mind and the body separate, but also that the physical world is inferior to an ideal world that exists somewhere else. Spirituality, as ostensibly manifested in most religions, maintains that we must rise above the reality we experience and, in a certain way, not only transcend it, but discard it. This point of view can ultimately be traced back, in Western thought at least, to Plato. So again, it is of special interest to us that the non-dualistic position of those affiliated with Trika Kaula offered enjoyments and liberation, and, if I may say, liberation through enjoyments, including the enjoyment of sex. Abhinavava Gupta describes the Kuliyaga in chapter 29 of his massive and encyclopedic Tantra Loka. Perhaps his greatest work, Abhinava intended the Tantra Loka, which we were referred to as the TA, to be a single, comprehensive, and authoritative source book of all available Shaiva, Tantra, and Trika literature and lore as well as a theological treatise meant to distill the essence of these scriptures and lay bare the procedures necessary for realizing divination, or Bahairavahood. The meaning of the word kula in the kula yaga or kula sacrifice, also known as the adi yaga or primordial sacrifice, 
requires some explanation. The term kula, literally family or clan, was used by the Kapalikas to refer to the families or lineages of the yoginis, but the Kaula movement expanded the term to mean the body, i.e., both the physical body and the body of the universe, a cosmic body which consists of and encompasses the powers of the families of goddesses. In the context of T.A., Abhinava means the term Kula to refer to the supreme power, consciousness and bliss of the Absolute, that is to say, of Shiva. According to T.A. 29.6, whatever a practitioner performed with mind, word, and body to evoke a state of mind-being is said to be a Kula sacrifice, Yaga. That being said, Abhinava emphasizes the secret ritual with a sexual partner as the primary means. In TA 29.7, Abhinava actually mentions six specific ways the Kula sacrifice can be performed. 1. In worldly activities. 2. In relation to a woman through a mere glance. 3. In the couple's union. 4. In body. 5. Breath, prana. And 6. Thought. However, it is clear that he places the most importance on ritual sexual union, that is to say, sacrifice. This sexual rite is clearly rooted in the practices in the earlier Kapalika and Yugini cults, but transforms these practices in several important ways. The semi-divine Yoginis are no longer seen as bloodthirsty external deities that penetrate and possess one from the outside but rather as the deities of the senses who reside in the body and revel in the pleasures. In the Trika Kala Reformation, the deity hierarchies of the earlier possession cult become the inner projections of Shiva's cosmic form within the practitioner's own, now cosmologized, body. Similarly, sexual intercourse no longer serves the primary purpose of producing potent sexual fluids which attract and gratify the yoginis and which are consumed to achieve the goal of supernatural powers rather the ritual sex of the trika kaula is liberation oriented and practiced primarily for the experience of its practitioner's personal orgasmic pleasure an experience that is considered to manifest the latent inner bliss of absolute consciousness. The Trika Kala tradition acknowledges that ordinarily sense pleasure clouds awareness and perpetuates ignorance of one's true nature, but believes that if one can suspend the desiring ego, sensory enjoyment is liberated and intensified, becoming the doorway to realization of Shiva. While the practice of ritual sexual intercourse with a consort's principal purpose in the earlier Kapalika and Yogini cults was to produce the power substances needed to gratify the deities, here the ritual of copulation is aestheticized. Orgasm is no longer principally a means of production of fluids for the sake of the deities, including and especially the Yoginis, it is a privileged means of access to a blissful expansion of consciousness in which the deities of the Kula permeate and obliterate the ego of the worshipper. The consumption of meat and alcohol is interpreted along the same lines. Their purpose, like that of everything else in the liturgy, is to intensify experience, to gratify the goddesses of the senses. The yoginis of the senses relish this offering of nectar and, gratified thereby, they converge and fuse with the practitioner's inner transcendental identity as Bhairava. In order to practice the Kula Yaga, one must first be properly initiated. According to Abhinava, ordinary initiation takes place in two primary ways which can be combined into a single ceremony. The first consists of the dropping of a flower onto a mandala and or the drinking of an oblation of forbidden substances. I am not going to list all of the substances for the purposes of this episode. However, suffice it to say that they include certain other excretions not spoken of here. 
More specifically, the blindfolded disciple drops a flower over a mandala, a visual representation of the divinity-filled cosmos, and from the flower's fall, the guru interprets the kula, the clan of yoginis of a particular goddess, the disciple belongs to, and determines what his personal mantra will be. The receiving of this mantra, which is considered to be identical to one's deity, is imparted directly from the mouth of the guru, and is perhaps the defining feature of initiation. It is not so much the guru who whispers the mantra into the ear of the disciple, rather the guru, by his silent concentration, causes the goddess to make the disciple drop the flower upon the mandala, and so to reveal which mantra, which goddess, which kula and its attendant ritual have been chosen for the disciple. The guru discerns the kula and then, one may suppose, utters to the disciple the phonic form of the mantra, so that the mantra is both visual and oral. The rare disciple deemed worthy, which is to say, the disciple who responds without fear or hesitation to the ordinary initiation and especially to the oblation, and thus indicates his high degree of absorption into Shakti, is given a further initiation as a son. In fact, Abhinava uses the word initiation, diksa, only to describe the initiation as a son. In this higher form of initiation, the guru, through intense contemplation, causes the descent of Shakti into the disciple, and, combining visualization with the recitation and installation of mantras, causing this energy, Shakti, to burn the bonds of the disciple, thus cleansing his perception, releasing him from the grips of karma and rebirth, and bringing him into full absorption, that is to say, liberation. One cannot help but observe that Shakti, the primordial, inconceivable cosmic energy, is an eternal goddess. Thus, what the Guru causes is the descent of a primordial female cosmic energy into the sun. So, the initiation into Trikakaula is in fact about Shakti. Once the Trikakaula practitioner has successfully completed this initiation process, he becomes qualified to perform the Kula ritual with the sexual partner. The ritual is performed in a private place and, unlike many other rituals, can be performed on any day and at any time. The ritual begins with the practitioner purifying himself through the recitation and installation upon the body of mantras, these mantras each being equated with specific goddesses who, in turn, represent aspects of the absolute visualized within his own body. In this way, the practitioner divinizes his own body, makes his body divine. He, that is to say, the disciple who has achieved the status son, proceeds to prepare a vessel, often fashioned from a human skull, a visible reminder of the ritual's kapalika background, filling it with the forbidden and highly polluting substances known as the three M's, wine, madhya, meat, mamsa, and sexual fluid, maithuna, also translated as sexual intercourse. We will be using the word maithuna again with this meaning throughout this episode. The filling of the vessel with the three M's is considered to be an expression of the inner reality of the mantra, which is the bliss of Shiva and Shakti. Through deep contemplation of and identification with the mantra, he then brings himself into the state of Bhairava. Next, he proceeds to worship the goddesses, mantras within his body, by offering the vessel's contents. He gratifies these goddesses of the senses, externally, by sprinkling drops from the vessel over his body, and internally, by consuming the offering. This completes the first phase of the ritual. The practitioner and his consort, Shakti, or duty, who has been chosen by the guru without regard to caste, now face each other and together satiate their senses through incense and the consumption of the three M's, wine, meat, sexual fluids, as well as with measures which are suitable to themselves 
such as embracing, passionate kissing, etc. The Tantra Loka stresses that the sex, food, and drink of the ritual must be enjoyed without selfish desire, greed, or attachment, and that these pleasures should be undertook as expressions of the bliss of Shiva consciousness. Jayaratha states that the set of the three M's is to be utilized by the person who has entered upon the Kula path for the reason that he is in every way committed simply to manifesting his own bliss. The set of the three M's is not to be utilized out of greed. Soon after this, he writes specifically about the sexual act again. In this ritual, the activity is not undertaken because of a desire for sexual pleasure in a worldly sense. Rather, the activity is undertaken in keeping with a later instruction, because of the intensity of the absorption into the very nature of undivided supreme consciousness. Furthermore, the text states that one who performs the ritual without following these prescriptions will go to hell to experience thousands of hellish tortures. Imagining themselves as the divine couple of Shiva and Shakti, the initiate and his consort engage in the movements of intercourse which symbolize the ceasing and arising of emanation and dissolution, the whole rhythm of the pulsating universe. They eventually come to conceive these movements as a unity in which they become each other, truly a pair and not monads, mirroring the highest reality in which Shiva and Shakti are not two but one. Intensely aware of the erotic ecstasy of their union, its pleasures intensified by their lack of ego consciousness, the practitioners come to experience the bliss of absolute consciousness that is their very own nature. Abhinava explains that when the awareness of one's own nature becomes evident through the enjoyment of the respective pleasures, one by one the goddesses of the sub-circles enter into the central circle of consciousness. Here he describes the various levels of consciousness as a series of concentric circles emanating out from and being reabsorbed back into the central or principal circle of Shiva, i.e. pure consciousness. Thus, through the pleasures of the three M's, and especially in the orgasm of sexual union, the couple mutually expands individual consciousness to the point where it becomes one with, is fully reabsorbed into the principal circle of Shiva consciousness. Abhinava explains that. The expression of differentiated thought subsides for the pair who are in that state, i.e. pure consciousness, and Jayaratha adds that this state is the universal bliss which consists of the perfect fusion of Shiva and Shakti. In this state of bliss, the practitioners proceed to the point of orgasm, an experience which produces a particular effect in the Shakti so that there is an emanation, which here refers to the sexual fluid which may flow at this intense moment of unity and symbolizes bliss as well as the manifestation of the whole universe. By focusing intently on the experience of orgasm, the initiate gains access to the prior emitting reality, the undivided consciousness just before emanation, and thus attains liberation. The prior emitting reality in other words, the reality, the emitting reality, prior to the creation of, the emanation of, our universe. Our focus has been on the seeker of liberation, the Mumutsku. However, at this point in the text, Abhinava prescribes a separate ritual for the one seeking powers, Siddhis, the Bupuksku. This ritual is focused on the consumption of the inherently powerful substance of the female sexual fluid. While Abhinava's focus is on liberation through the experience of absolute consciousness, he also maintains the consumption of sexual fluids for those seeking enjoyments and powers. He remarks, Those who desire to acquire a supernatural power should consume the ejaculated form, 
It is not clear to me whether the ejaculated form reserves exclusively to semen discharged by the male via ejaculation, or also to female sexual fluids produced during coitus. A squirting orgasm is sometimes called female ejaculation. Squirting refers to a fluid expelled from the vagina during orgasm. Not all people with vaginas squirt during orgasm, and those who do may only squirt some of the time. Squirting sometimes involves secretions from the skein's gland. The skein's glands are sometimes called the female prostate because they function similarly to the male prostate. At any rate, it appears that both women and men may acquire supernatural powers during oral sex as long as such oral sex includes the consumption of sexual fluids. While Abhinava does not deny the value of the Siddhis, he clearly places the bliss of supreme consciousness at the top of his system and connects it to the final purpose of attaining Jivan Mukti, liberation while still alive. I should pause here to comment that the CDs and their attainment play an important role in my Sophia tetralogy of novels which are now available for pre-order from Amazon. Abhinava Gupta also describes a variation of the sexual ritual which he actually seems to consider a higher level, wherein the mantra plays a more fundamental role. First, the practitioner identifies with the mantra then he recites it continually with intense contemplation and concentration, thereby bringing a state of indefinable spontaneous creative awareness, the same creative awareness that gives the mantra its power. Then, and only then, the initiate unites with the consort so that the energies and pleasures of sexual intercourse may give further potency to the mantra. Abhinava writes, the awareness which occurs at the moment of absorption into the Kekara Mudra, here meaning the seal or mudra of the bliss of intercourse, during the mutual kissing, pleasure, play, laughter, and so on of the Shakti, and the one who possesses Shakti, is the potency of the mantra. The practitioner is now to focus on the natural and spontaneous mantra, Ha Ha, which is uttered in the throat of his sexual consort at the peak experience of orgasm. I am delighted to see play, laughter, and the spontaneous mantra of ha ha being apotheosized in this way. When some individuals hear the word ritual, it conjures forth something somber, sober, and deadly serious. But to return to ha ha, the practitioner is now to focus on the natural and spontaneous mantra, ha ha, which is uttered in the throat of a sexual consort at the peak experience of orgasm. Focused intently on this sound, which is a pure and spontaneous expression of the bliss of ultimate consciousness, the practitioner experiences the supreme pervasion of the mantra and thus attains the state of Jvanmukti. Abhinava concludes his discussion of the sexual ritual with these words, recalling in every action and in every place the pervasion of the mantra in this fashion. Being unattached, liberated while living, he becomes the supreme, Bhairava. The performance of this tantric sex ritual is a display which articulates to one's own self a new subjectivity, in opposition to the dormant subjectivity provided by society. In India, Kama, in the form of erotic or sexual pleasure, was seen as a legitimate purpose in life, as indicated in early literature such as the Manusmriti and the Mahabharata, as well as in popular works such as Vachanayaya's 3rd century CE, Kama Sutra. In the first line of Yohohara's commentary, on the Kama Sutra, he writes, Those who talk about pleasure say that pleasure is the most important of the three aims of human life, because it is both the cause and the result of the other two, religion and power. As early as the Ban Aranyaka Upanishad, we see sex equated with a ritual act, specifically with Vedic sacrifice, possessing great power if performed with the proper knowledge. To quote from this Upanishad, 
Her vulva is the sacrificial ground. Her pubic hair is the sacred grass. Her labia majora are the soma press. And her labia minora are the fire blazing at the center. A man who engages in sexual intercourse with this knowledge obtains as great a world as a man who performs a soma sacrifice. And he appropriates to himself the merits of the woman with whom he has sex. I repeat, he appropriates to himself the merits of the woman with whom he has sex. An ongoing theme of this episode, the male gaining by virtue of intercourse the merits of the woman with whom he has sex. That women have powers and knowledge beyond what men do. It would be tantric groups, such as the Kashmiri Shaivas discussed here, who, in practices such as Kuliyaga, would draw on and revitalize these earlier Indian traditions of ritualizing sexuality and connecting orgasm with the bliss of divine consciousness. Drawing on these historical precedents, as well as the transgressive tradition of the Kapalikas and Yogini cults, Trika Kaula initiates practiced a ritual form of sexual union in which sex is no longer an ordinary human act of pleasure or procreation. The prominent role played by women and female energies fluids in the Trikakala cults was itself a transgression of both orthodox Indian ascetic perspectives and the dominant social attitudes toward women of the time. The orthodox ascetic, Smanyasi, viewed women with fear and hostility and considered them the most powerful source of desire and attachment. While the status slash role of women was certainly elevated in the Trika Kaula as compared to their position slash power in mainstream culture, it is important to note several things here. One, this elevation in status slash power was not reflected outside the private setting of Kula Yaga. Two, the role of women in the Trika Kaula and all later tantric traditions was significantly reduced in comparison to the power given to them in the yogini cults. In other words, over time, the role of women was decreased and the status of women was lessened. A number of scholars have noted a clear subordination of feminine power to the male tantric practitioner and guru as part of the increasing masculinization of tantra that occurred in India beginning in the 10th century. The Vijnana Bhairava is one of the foundational revealed texts of Tantric Shaivism and was a significant influence of Abhinava Gupta, so much so that he termed the Shiva Vajna Upanishad the esoteric teaching for the direct knowledge of Shiva. The text is difficult to date and undoubtedly came before the 9th century AD and perhaps several centuries earlier than that. The following verses seem to have been especially important to Abhinava. At the time of sexual intercourse with a woman, an absorption into her is brought about by excitement, and the final delight that ensues at orgasm betokens the delight of Brahman. The delight is, in reality, that of one's own self. This delight is, in reality, that of one's own self. O oh goddess, even in the absence of a woman, there is a flood of delight. Simply by the intensity of the memory of sexual pleasure in the form of kissing, embracing, pressing, and more. At this point, we are going to turn in part to the work of David Gordon White, who is now a professor at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Among his books are The Alchemical Body, Siddha Traditions in Medieval India, and Kiss of the Yogini, Tantric Sex in its South Asian Contexts, from which I shall now quote and on which I shall proceed to comment. New Age Tantra is to medieval Tantra what finger painting is to fine art, a remarkably unimaginative series of yogic exercises applied to the sexual act 
Equitus Reservatus par excellence, a sad attempt to mechanize the mysteries of sexual love. Here, Professor White is quoting in part from Indian psychologist Suhid Kakar, who has been named by the French weekly Le Nouvel Observateur as one of the 25 major thinkers of the world. According to Professor White, sexualized ritual practice is the sole truly distinctive contribution of South Asian tantric traditions. All of the other elements of tantric practice, the ritual use of mandalas, mantras, and mudras, worship of terrible or benign deities, fire offerings, induced possession, sorcery, and so on, may be found elsewhere in traditions whose emic self-definitions are not necessarily tantric. In addition, all of the elements of tantric exegesis, that is, tantric mysticism, are second-hand reflections not unique to Tantra. Since its origins in the 6th or 7th centuries, Tantra has essentially consisted of a body of techniques for the control of the multiple, often female, beings, both for one's own benefit and as tools to use against others. These may be reduced to three principal types. 1. Mantras acoustic formulae that control said beings. 2. Techniques of possession in which these same beings act through one's own body. And 3. The gratification of these beings through sacrificial offerings. Later tantric practice came to be grounded in a theory of transformative aesthetics in which the experience of orgasm affected a breakthrough from contracted self-consciousness to expanded God consciousness, in which the entire universe came to be experienced as self. We note here the equation of orgasm with God consciousness and thus with the self's experience of the entire universe. Anyone who has ever experienced true orgasm, and we grant that for men this generally does not occur, quote, naturally, unquote, will agree with this statement. André Padu, citing Madeleine Beraudou, offered an overarching definition of tantric doctrine that has since held the field, and we quote, Tantra is an attempt to place kama, desire, in every sense of the word, in the service of liberation, not to sacrifice this world for liberation's sake, but to reinstate it in various ways within the perspective of salvation. This use of kama, desire, and all of its aspects of this world to gain both worldly and supernatural enjoyments, bhukti, and powers, siddhis, and to obtain liberation in life, jivan mukti, implies a particular attitude on the part of the tantric adept toward the cosmos, in which he feels integrated with an all-embracing system of micro-macrocosmic correlations. A modern thinker who wrote extensively about desire was the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Lacan told the story of a man who enacts a strange ritual after sex. On the way back home, he stands by the side of a railway track and, in the light of a passing train, drops his pants, flashing a carriage full of people, knowing that there isn't the slightest risk of getting caught. Here is what Lacan has to say about this. What the act in question shows, first and foremost, beyond any other interpretation, is that he has had and has realized his satisfaction. This act thus indicates what is left over, what is to be desired beyond satisfaction. Even if for this man the sex was satisfying, he nevertheless had to make room for something else for a desire to appear in spite of this realized satisfaction. Furthermore, Lacan wrote, Man's desire is the desire of the other. What Lacan meant by this is that desire is essentially a desire for recognition from the other. Desire pushes for recognition. It is less a question of what we desire as much as it is that we be recognized. 
Moreover, Lacan believes that this dependence on the other for recognition is responsible for structuring not only our desires, but even our drives. In light of this, I suggest the Tantra, in placing kama, desire, at the service of liberation, jivan mukti, confers upon Tantra an even greater value than was imagined by the gurus and yogis of ancient India. It gives us a means to fulfill our desires, our own bodily desires, without dependence on the other for recognition or for anything else. Tantra originated among a subaltern stratum of the Indian population that, lacking the means to procure the dravyams of orthodox worship rites, made use of readily available human sexual fluids in its practice. Women, reputed to be witches, sometimes called yoginis, consumed vital fluids in their covens, including both the blood of child and adult victims and the sexual fluids of their male partners. Elite tantric practitioners self-consciously subverted orthodox purity codes by manipulating sexual fluids as a means of effecting a powerful expansion of consciousness. Beyond the limited practice of the conformist Brahman practitioner to the all-encompassing God-consciousness of the tantric superman. A late Kala compilation from the 16th century, the Kala Valnir Maya, describes the high tantric goddess's taste for vital fluids in the clearest possible way. The goddess is fond of the vulva and the penis, fond of the nectar of the vulva and the penis. Therefore, one should fully worship the goddess with the nectar of vulva and penis. A man who worships the goddess by drinking the virile fluid and by taking pleasure in the wife of another man as well as with the nectar of the vulva and penis, knows no sorrow and becomes possessed of perfect mantras. But he who worships Kandika without the clan-generated fluids will see the good deeds of a thousand lifetimes destroyed. We now quote from another book by David Gordon White, namely The Alchemical Body, in which he sees the yogic, Cetic alchemist as essentially concerned with the creation and intensification of a body of light. With early tantrism, the female and male procreative fluids came to be conceived as power substances for the worship of, and ultimately the identification with, gods and goddesses whose boundless energy was often portrayed as sexual in nature. Nearly always the god in question was some form of Shiva, the god whose worship in the form of a linga, phallus, dates from at least the 2nd century BC. The way to become a second Shiva, for this has nearly always been the goal of tantric practice in its various forms, was, in early tantrism, realized through the conduit of a horde of wild goddesses, which the tantrikas, the earthly practitioners of tantra, identified with their human consorts, generally known as Yoginis. These bliss-starved goddesses, attracted by offerings of mingled sexual fluids, would converge into the consciousness of the practitioner to transform him, through their limitless libido, into a god on earth. Here is some wonderful, if you will, sex advice from a late medieval Tamil poem entitled Treatise on the Arrow of Lust. First stage, like a cow which licks tenderly its calf, spread your tongue broad and lick her yoni, lapping up the juices oozing out like a thirsty dog which laps cool water. Second stage, like a worshipper who circumambulates the shrine, pass your tongue over her yoni, round round from left to right, moving in ever narrowing circles till you reach the very center. Her yoni will open up like a dark and gaping chasm. Open then the vulva's lips with firm pressure of your tongue and insert its stiff tip inside like a spear's powerful thrust, digging, poking deep and far. Third stage, with your nose pressing against the yoni mani, the clitoris, your tongue enters her innermost shrine, thrusting and digging and piking deep 
searching for hidden treasures inside. Inhale deeply, breathing in the mellow odors of the juices of her yoni. Fourth stage, taking the protruding, throbbing jewel of her yoni, gently, gently between your teeth and tongue, suck it like a suckling feeding at the breast. It will rise and glisten, stand up from its sheath. It will swell like a large ruby. The fragrant, copious discharge, appearing like sweet foam between the lips of the vulva, is a rejuvenating drink when mixed with your milk-white, lustrous, thick and fragrant sperm. In New Age Tantra, it is a male's ability to bring his female partner to sustained, abundant orgasm without himself shedding his seed that is stressed with reference to an erroneous paradigm that Buddhist tantric sex always remained unconsummated. That is, that it ended in coitus interruptus and a supposed ecstatic mystical experience for both partners. While this does become the rule in later conformist Buddhist tantric sources, it was not the original practice, and once again, the New Age practitioners of Tantra are shown to be without historical foundation. Mouth-to-mouth transmissions lay at the heart of Kaula practice. To remind ourselves once again, this is a religious tradition in Tantra Shaktism and Shaivism characterized by distinctive rituals and symbolism connected with the worship of Shiva and Shakti. It flourished in ancient India primarily in the first millennium of the Christian era. In later Hatha Yoga, the Kala visualization of Kundalini rising through a system of chakras is overlaid onto the earlier Bindu-oriented semen. It is said, the best of elixirs is an excellent fluid deposited within one's own body. It is known as kula. It is said, by simply eating it, a man becomes immortal and praised as Shiva. Elsewhere, the man who continuously eats this fluid in its mixed form becomes the darling of the yoginis. It is said in all the teachings that non-aging and immortality are offered through the primary mouth, that is, the mouth of the yogini, and that it is passed back and forth from mouth to mouth. Here, this means from the mouth of the yogini into one's own mouth, then into the mouth of the shakti, then into one's own mouth. Thereupon, the guru should cast it into the offertory bowl, etc. It is said, taking with one's mouth the ball, golaka, of that which will have oozed out, i.e., male semen, and the basin, kunda, i.e., female discharge, located there at the level of the loins, taking that great fluid, mahadravanya, at the level of the loins, one should transmit it to the mouth of one's consort. Causing it to pass back to one's own mouth, one should fill the offertory vessel with that. Having mixed together the great fluid, Maharasa, by passing it from mouth to mouth, one should feed the circle of the female deities and also the male viral heroes with it. It is said, having aroused the duty, he whose own desire has also been quickened should eat the accumulation of fluid, dravyanakayam, that has come forth from them, back and forth with her. The Tantric Hero in the cremation ground of the yoginis, incites these multiple female beings to devour him, both from within through their fiery sexual fluids and from without by making him food for the yoginis in order precisely that they may transform him into their superhuman lover and master. With this new, expanded perspective, we are going to represent the passage from David Gordon's white book, the alchemical body, Siddha traditions in medieval India. With early tantrism, these procreative fluids came to be conceived as power substances for the worship of, and ultimately the identification with, gods and goddesses whose boundless energy was often portrayed as sexual in nature. Nearly always, the god in question was some form of Shiva, the god whose worship in the form of a linga phallus dates from at least the 2nd century BC. 
The way to becoming a second Shiva, for this has nearly always been the goal of tantric practices in its various forms, was in early tantrism, realized through the conduit of a horde of wild goddesses, which the tantrikas identified with their human consorts, generally known as yoginis. These bliss-starved goddesses, attracted by offerings of mingled sexual fluids, would converge into the consciousness of the practitioner to transform him through their limitless libido into a god on earth. Those were the good old days. Now, Professor White goes on to say, following the brilliant 10th or 11th century reconfiguration of Trikakaulism by Apinavagupta and others, most of the messy parts of tantric practice, at least outward practice, were cleaned up, aestheticized, and internalized in different ways. For the later high tantric schools, the cult of the Yoginis and the ritual production, offering, and consummation of sexual fluids were continued but only within the restricted context of the secret practice of an inner circle of initiates. Outwardly, however, ritual sexuality had undergone a paradigm shift. Sexual fluids themselves were no longer the way to Godhead. Rather, it was in the bliss of sexual orgasm that one realized God... Rather, it was in the bliss of sexual orgasm that one realized God consciousness for oneself. This sounds good. God consciousness was still achievable by, and only by, orgasm, at least in the initial changes of this revolution. However, at the same time, between the 10th and 12th centuries, there was within Hindu Tantra a subordination of the feminine. The multiple yoginis and shaktis and their human counterparts of the Kala tradition to the person of the male practitioner, the male guru in particular. This subordination occurred on a number of levels that included one, the internalization of the yoginis and their circles into the chakras of hatha yogic practice. Two, the semanticization of the yoginis into seed mantras. Three, the masculinization of the tantric initiation and four, the introduction of ritual substitutes for the reference of the five M-words, including Maithuna, sexual intercourse. Helen Crovetto, in her paper, Bhairavi Chakta, Goddess Mandalas, Rituals in Contemporary Tantra's Non-Dualism, reminds us that after Ananda Bhairavi is worshipped, her male counterpart, Ananda Bhairava, is visualized and revered. The pair is then imagined in cosmic or sexual union within the jar. At this point, five substances or items referred to as the pancha makara, the five M-words, are consecrated with the mantra and offered to Ananda Bhairavi. The five substances, tattvas, are usually understood as meat, fish, wine, parched grain, and sexual ritual, Maithuna, although the interpretation of words' meanings varies from one tantric group to another. The practitioner eats or drinks the first four items after they have been offered. The text suggests adjustments for the Kali age. They include substituting Madhura Traya, a combination of milk, sugar, and honey, for purified wine, and mantra meditation on Devi's feet, for sexual ritual. Where meat, fish, wine, and sexual ritual were used in Pancha Makara ingredients, early 20th century British Tantra scholar John Woodruff said their purpose was, quote, as a means of controlling and curbing appetites and ultimately associating them with religious worship. This relates to remarks cited earlier by contemporary Tantra scholar David Gordon White. Helen Crovetto calls our attention to comments by Hugh B. Urban, a professor at Ohio State University, who is best known both for his study of Tantra, for his critical scholarly book about the Church of Scientology, and for his book Zorba the Buddha about Osho and the cult he founded. Urban describes Woodruff's interpretation of the Maha Nirvana Tantra, as an attempt to defend, rationalize, and purify Tantra 
by removing or de-emphasizing some of the antinomian, worldly, and non-mystical aspects. Woodruff's objective had been to portray yogic processes as a superior expression of tantric ritual. That is to say, superior to tantric ritual, which had a strong emphasis on my thuna, on sex. In her article which we have been referencing, Helen Corvetto now turns to a more recent American manifestation of Tantra. To quote her, the view that Tantra is a form of sexual therapy with positive spiritual implications stems from any number of New Age seminars and books that have appeared in the last 30 years. Hugh Urban has documented how Americans' perception of Tantra as liberating sexual activity began from the early 20th century with Pierre Bernard's establishment of the Tantric Order in America, Tantric with a K. She concludes that among scholars of Hindu and Buddhist Tantra, the current prevailing opinion is that ritual practice with a sexual component preceded the yogic forms and that the sexual rituals were not a degeneration of mysticism. I repeat, sexual rituals were not a degeneration of mysticism. Let us return to David Gordon White and what he has to say about the history of yoga. First, he quotes scholar David Lorenzen on the goals of yogic practice. Quote, in spite of abundant textual references to various siddhis, which Lorenzen defines as supernatural enjoyments, in classical yoga texts, many modern Indian scholars, and like-minded Western ones as well, have seized upon a single sutra of Patanjali, namely 3-37, to prove that magical powers were regarded as subsidiary and even hindrances to final liberation. This was not the view of Patanjali, and certainly not the view of medieval practitioners of Hatha Yoga. White emphasizes the fact that one finds little of yogic practice in the sense of techniques involving fixed postures, asanas, and breath control, pranayama, in the Yoga Sutras. References to the subtle body, the channels, nadis, and energy centers, chakras, are entirely absent from this work. In point of fact, Many, if not most, of the pre-12th century accounts of the practice of yoga describe it not as a form of meditative or physical practice, but rather as a battery of techniques for the attainment of the siddhis, including out-of-body experiences, entering the bodies of others as a means of escaping death, or merely to feed on them, invisibility, the power of flight, transmutation, and so on. The form yogin, or yogasvara, master of yoga, like the feminine yogini, or yagasvari, most often means sorcerer or magician. White calls our attention to the fact that the first time that the term chakra comes to be employed in a systematic way is in the work Kala Jnana Nirnaya by the 10th Matshyandra, regarded as a saint and yogi in both Hindi and Buddhist traditions. One who is devoted to meditation upon the worship of the first chakra, namely mingling with the yoginis, yogini melakam, obtains the eight supernatural powers, siddhis. With the second chakra, one obtains the power of attraction, with the third entering into the body of another person, and so on. Just as an aside, I would like to call attention to a supposedly minor chakra not usually mentioned, namely the Yonistana, which is the meeting place of Shiva and Shakti. It is a place of bliss called, like the Muladhara, Kama Rupa. It is the source of desire and, on the carnal level, an anticipation of the union of Shiva and Shakti, which is accomplished in the Sahasara. Here, I would like to take a moment to refer the listener to a discussion of the chakras contained in a previous episode of Explore Ecstatic Sexuality. Dr. Hiroshi Motoyama, who holds doctorates in psychology and philosophy, founded the Institute for Religion and Psychology in Japan and is the author of over 20 books. He and his group have designed several laboratory instruments specifically designed to study the chakras. 
The chakra instrument was designed to detect the energy generated in the body and then emitted from it in terms of various physical variables. Unlike the electroencephalograph and other instruments of electrophysiology, it is designed to detect minute energy changes, electric, magnetic, optical, in the immediate environment of the subject. The AMI, apparatus for measuring the functional conditions of meridians and their corresponding internal organs, is an instrument designed to measure the initial skin current as well as the steady state current in response to DC voltage externally applied at special acupuncture points located alongside the base of finger and toenails. A variety of studies have been performed at Dr. Motoyama's institute with the chakra instrument and the AMI machine, which studies have led to some very provocative results. I would like to concentrate here on the results of certain studies conducted with subjects who had clearly displayed various types of chakra activity and psi, that is to say psychic abilities. Basically, Dr. Motoyama and his group found that the type of psi ability evidenced does seem to be connected to the specific chakras supposedly responsible for them and that such subjects, in turn, do show characteristic patterns of abnormality in their meridian systems. Further, he found supportive evidence of the traditional notion that psi abilities can be classified into two types, the powers of reception and the powers of generation. The powers of reception seem to be linked to the lower chakras and the powers of generation to the higher. This set of data implies quite profoundly that psi energy working in the Anahata Chakra may be able to create energy in the physical dimension, light, electricity, etc. The recordings made on the AMI machine and on the chakra instrument point to the possibility that the psi energy working in the chakras can extinguish or create energy in the physical dimension. These two properties are of great significance and if substantiated, would indicate the need for a basic revision of the law of conservation of energy as presently formulated in modern physics. Resuming in the midst of all of this fun and games. Mircea Eliade was a Romanian historian of religion, a fiction writer, a philosopher, and professor at the University of Chicago, where one of his assistants was none other than David Gordon White. In his work on the history of religion, Eliade is most highly regarded for his writings on alchemy, shamanism, and yoga. In his book, Yoga, Immortality and Freedom, which we shall now discuss, Eliade makes the point that in Buddhist Tantrism, we recognize a sort of religious rediscovery of the mystery of woman. For in Buddhist Tantrism, every woman becomes the incarnation of the Shakti. Mystical emotion in the presence of the mystery of generation and fecundity. Such it is in part. But it is also recognition of all that is remote, transcendent, invulnerable in woman. And thus, woman comes to symbolize the irreducibility of the sacred and the divine, the inapprehensible essence of the ultimate reality. Woman incarnates both the mystery of creation and the mystery of being, of everything that is, that incomprehensibly becomes, dies, and is reborn. To quote Eliade, one must never lose sight of this primacy of the Shakti, in the last analysis of the divine woman and mother, in tantrism and in all the movements deriving from it. The Vamakaris expect to attain identification with Shiva and Shakti through ritual indulgence in wine, meat, and sexual union. The Kularnava Tantra even insists that union with God can be obtained only through sexual union and the famous Guya Samaha Tantra categorically affirms no one succeeds in attaining perfection by employing difficult and vexing operations. But 
perfection can be gained by satisfying all one's desires. This reminds us of Jacques Lacan's famous injunction, never give up on your desire. The same Tantra adds that sensuality is permitted. We say, who's ah to that? And let us not forget that the aim of the Gu Yasamaja Tantra is rapid arrival at Buddhahood. In India, the Gu Yasamaja Tantra was classified as a yoga or Mahayoga Tantra. In Tibet, it is considered an unexcelled Tantra, Myal Drabla Bend Yoga. I'm going to permit myself here a brief divigation on the topic of the Kular Nava Tantra. This Tantra has some very curious passages. For example, after a good deal of drinking has taken place, and here we begin an extensive quotation from this work, excited by passion, treating other men as their own beloveds, the ladies take their shelter. The men also, exhilarated in proud Han Tulasa, behave likewise. Intoxicated men embrace men. The bewildered ladies ask their men questions like, Who are you? Who am I? Who are these people around? Why are we sitting here? Is it a garden of our own home? Yogis take food from each other's vessels and dance around. Filling wine in their mouths, they make ladies drink it from their mouth itself, put pungent things in their mouths, and then transfer them to the mouth of their beloved. Exhilarated yogis fall on the ladies, and intoxicated yoginis fall upon the men. O Kula Nayike, thus fulfilling their own desires, they perform various such actions. A fool who reproaches a Kalika in this Bhairava form is indubitably destroyed by the yoginis, that is to say, by the women. Seeing intoxicated sahakas in a chakra, one who develops a reverent feeling toward them and gladly prays them with devotion obtains the status of yoginis. In the state of six ulasa, called unmana, actions like falling down and rising up and repeated swoonings take place. How can persons engrossed in self-study know the indescribable pleasure derived in this state. Pleasure in this state is beyond description and can only be experienced. Engrossed in the supreme bliss of Brahma Dhyana are men of highly meritorious actions. The world is the form of Shiva and Shakti. Without nectar of Bhaga and Lingam, I am not satisfied by even thousands of vessels of wine and hundreds of heaps of flesh. Then later on in the same Kularnava Tantra, O oh my beloved, the pleasure derived from Ali, wine, and Maithuna, sex slash orgasm, is auspicious to those who are knowers of truth. O oh Kulasvari, bad qualities turn good. What is not kindred grows kindred, and what is contrary to dharma becomes dharma. And later still, bodily organs engage themselves in their functions. Understanding this leaves aside the ego feeling. Actions do not taint. I repeat, actions do not taint. Huh. Reminds me a little of Aleister Crowley as well as Lacan. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And then, love is the law. Love under will. A few observations are in order. The above is a translation by Ram Kumar Rai, published by him in Varanasi, India in 1983. It is number five in the series, Tantra Granthamala. It sold, at the time, for 60 rupees. What is extremely interesting about this publication, aside from the fact that it is the only English translation which has ever been published, is that it sidesteps the work of Arthur Avalon, a pseudonym for the British Orientalist, as they used to say, Sir John George Woodruff. 
Woodruff saw as his mission to bowdlerize the tantric text which he published, which is to say, to represent anything sexual in them as visions rather than as experiences which one was instructed to have and told how to have in real life. This brings me to a brief aside, an aside on a divagation, if one may say that. Many people today, including people whom I respect, say that Tantra is not all about sex, or even Tantra is not about sex, full stop. As David Gordon White and others have shouted from the rooftops, so to speak, Tantra was always about sex. At its origins, Tantra was about sex. So here, in a Tantra which scholar and translator Ram Kumar Rai describes as, quote, one of the major Tantras of the Kaula school, and as a Tantra which commands great authority, authenticity, and respect, we find instructions on how to have an orgy. One is told that to have an orgy is good. Furthermore, this is not only a polyamorous orgy in every respect, but also an orgy where bisexual behavior is encouraged. I am failing in my attempts to think of any other religious, quasi-religious, or spiritual document where this type of activity is described at all, let alone as something that is good for the participants. Good for them spiritually, as it were. Even in the works of the great beast himself, Alistair Crowley, instructions are seldom so straightforward. What astounds me is that I have not been able to locate any commentaries on the sexual orgiastic aspects of this Tantra. In fact, there are very few commentaries on it at all, and none of them deals with these sexual matters explicitly. So, if I may throw flowers at myself, as a sexy ex of mine used to say, you heard it here first, on Explore Ecstatic Sensuality, and you heard it exclusively. Now back to Mikhail Eliade's discussion of Maithuna. Eliade explains that Maithuna was known from Vedic times, but it remained for Tantrism to transform it into an instrument of salvation. In pre-Tantric India, we must distinguish two possible ritual values of sexual origin, both of which, we may note, are archaic in structure and of unquestionable antiquity. One conjugal union as a hierogamy, a sacred ritual in which a man and a woman represent a goddess and a god. 2. Orgiastic sexual union, to the end either of procuring universal fecundity, rain, harvest, flocks, women, etc., or of creating a magical defense. Even in one of the earliest Upanishads, the Chandogya Upanishad, from the 8th century B.C., we read that sexual union is transposed and valorized as liturgical chant, saman. In particular, the Vama Devya, the melody accompanying the pressing of the noonday soma. This is the Vamo Devya Saman, as woven upon copulation. He who knows thus the Vama Devya Saman, as woven upon copulation, comes to copulation procreates himself from every copulation. One should never abstain from any woman. That is his rule. The Buddhist texts, in fact, speak of Maithuna, and Buddha mentions certain ascetics who regard sensuality as one of the ways to gain nirvana. The monk Mag Aldika, in fact, offered the Buddha his daughter, Anupama, the incomparable. According to Emil Sinar, Buddha himself, if we are to believe the mythology of the tantric cycle, had set the example. It was by practicing Maithuna that he had succeeded in conquering Mara. In the same technique, he had made him omniscient and the master of magical powers. Eliade explains that every naked woman incarnates Prakriti, with Prakriti being all the cognitive, moral, psychological, emotional, sensorial, and physical aspects of reality. Hence, she is to be looked upon with the same adoration and the same detachment that one exercises in pondering the unfathomable secret of nature, its limitless capacity to create. The ritual nudity of the yogini has an intrinsic mystical value. 
If, in the presence of a naked woman, one does not find in one's inmost being the same terrifying emotion that one feels before the revelation of the cosmic mystery, there is no right. There is only a secular act with all the familiar consequences, strengthening of the karmic chain, etc. The second stage consists in the transformation of the vyo man prakriti into an incarnation of the shakti. The partner in the rite becomes a goddess, as the yogin must incarnate the god. Eliade describes Maithuna as a unity of emotion. Maithuna serves in the first place to make respiration rhythmical and to aid concentration. It is then a substitute for prananyama and dharana. The yogini is a girl whom the guru has instructed and whose body has been consecrated. Sexual union is transformed into a ritual through which the human couple becomes the divine couple. Pranayama and dhana represent only means by which during Maithuna the disciple achieves immobility and suppression of thought, the supreme great happiness, paramamahasuka, of the dohakosas. This is samrasa, sahidula translates it, identity of enjoyment, but it is rather a unity of emotion, or, more precisely, the paradoxical, inexpressible experience of the discovery of unity. Physiologically, samarasa is obtained during Maithuna when the sukra and the rajas remain motionless. But, as Sahidula observes, in accordance with the mystical language of the do hakosas, we may explain Maithuna, union of lotus, padma, and thunder, vajra, as realization of the state of emptiness, vajra equals sunya, in the plexus of the cerebral nerves, padma. We may understand girl as emptiness. The texts frequently emphasize the idea that Maithuna is above all an integration of the principles. The true sexual union is the union of the Parasakti Kundalini with Atman. Atman, of course, is in Hindu philosophy the self, the universal principle of individuation as distinct from the ego. When we read the statement, girl is emptiness, we are immediately reminded of Jacques Lacan's famous formula, usually rendered as, woman does not exist. What Lacan actually meant was that women do not lend themselves to generalization, even to phallocentric generalization. Lacan went on to add that woman is symptom of man and that a woman can only enter the psychic economy of man as a fantasy object, the cause of their desire. So, how is this different from the tantric text referenced above, where the girl, woman, is emptiness? But can one not turn that around and say that if woman is emptiness, she, unlike man, is every possibility? contains every possibility, and therefore is infinite? When we speak of emptiness, the word which comes immediately to mind is the oft-used philosophical term, the void. For French philosopher Alain Badiou, who was influenced by Lacan, reality is grounded on a void of inconsistent multiplicity, which is at once void and excess. This would not be Badiou's view, nor Lacan's, certainly. However, one might suggest that woman is such a void of inconsistent multiplicity, which is both void and excess. As woman remains the site of the excluded part, and thus of what Badiou calls an event, an event being something which instantly transforms everything, redefines everything. Woman as both void and excess. Woman remaining the excluded part, the event. Her presence, her being, is an ongoing, continuous event which instantly transforms everything, redefines everything. And this is another essential quality of the female. 
I would like to refer to another comment of Lacan's which relates to this and, if I may say, to many or most discussions of philosophy and religion in general. There is no whole, nothing is whole. This corresponds with Badiou's belief, referred to frequently in these podcasts, that everything is a multiplicity of multiplicities, and that there is no great one which we should strive to be a part of, meaning, in the final analysis, to be subordinate to. Thus, back again to sex. At the end of the day, the discussion revolves around questions such as, at what stage in the history of Indian thought did Maithuna become merely symbolic? Or, to put it another way, when did it become less about pleasure? When did pleasure become, in effect, redacted, filtered out of Maithuna? And when did the retention of sperm, meaning definitionally the absence of male orgasm, become the essence of Maithuna, as argued by Eliade? The Kapalikas were an extinct sect of Shaivite ascetics devoted to the Hindu god Shiva and dating back to the 8th century, which traditionally carried a skull-topped trident and an empty skull as a begging bowl. There is no possible doubt about the licentious rites practiced by the Kapalikas. Without renouncing the pleasures derived through the organs of sense, the eight great CDs may be obtained. To put this another way, you may obtain vast power, psychic, societal, and physical, without giving up pleasure. Ramanuja who distinguishes two classes of Kapalikas, one extremist, the other moderate, emphasizes their connections with sexual techniques. He makes the Kapalas say, He who knows the true nature of the six mudras, who understands the highest mudra, meditating on himself as in the position called Bhagasana, that is, visualizing himself as seated on the Pudendram Mulibre, reaches Nirvana. In this section, I refer to research by Dan O'Huigan at Cambridge University and, as is my wont, use that research as a launching pad for observations of my own. His focus is on strategies of legitimation in Tantric Buddhism. Tantra originated in a Hindu context, so when it, as it were, merged into Buddhism during the era in which Buddhism supplanted Hinduism as the prominent religion in India, Buddhism, in its tantric mode, utilized various strategies to legitimize itself within the broader Buddhist context. Is it an exaggeration to say that religion, broadly defined, is at least 70% marketing? Buddhist terms were given completely new meanings as part of the secret language of the Tantras. In part, this functioned as a code keeping some of the more transgressive elements of Tantrism concealed from the uninitiated. But, like other symbolism, it also served a deeper purpose of legitimation by linking the Tantric and the non-Tantric. Padma literally means lotus, which is a common theme in Buddhism and in Buddhist art, where the Buddha is often given a lotus seat. In the Doha Kua, it is interpreted as Bhaga, Volva. This meaning can also be seen in the famous mantra Om Mani Padme Hum, which can be understood at one level as a reference to sexual intercourse. Mani can refer to the penis. Vajra, which gives its meaning to Vajrayana, can refer to a particular ritual object or can mean diamond or thunderbolt. It can also represent sunyata or the penis, a meaning foregrounded in phrases such as Vajraba Sam Yoga. The Buddha himself is given secret meanings. According to the Hezvajra Tantra, Ba Gavan, i.e. the Buddha, is of the nature of semen. For Kanha, Bodhisattva is equivalent to Samfrataspanda Rupa Sukra, semen in the form of covered activity. In other words, when an innate Buddha mind is born, 
then semen arises. The interpretation of Mahasukam, great joy, especially sexual pleasure, as sunyata, provides a justification for rituals of Maithuna, intercourse. Karuna, or compassion, is redefined as equivalent to existence. Thus, presumably, the route to escaping existence is by destroying compassion, which may justify certain ritual practices. If I may add a gloss, certain antinomian ritual practices. The topic of antinomian practices will recur throughout this episode of this podcast. And we are going to make reference here, as elsewhere, to two different versions of dualism, which could go hand in hand or can be separate. One version of dualism, which we don't much care for, is that the mind and the body are separate. In this section, we are going to be making reference to a paper by Christian Wedemeyer entitled Locating Tantric Antinomianism, an essay toward an intellectual history of the practices, practice, observance, karya, karya vrata. This paper was a contribution to a panel at the 15th Congress of the International Association of Buddhist Studies, Atlanta, 23 to 28 June 2008, published in the Journal of the International Association of Buddhist Studies, 2012. Prior to exploring this paper's ideas further, a quick note on what antinomianism is. Antinomianism is, in its various manifestations, the rejection of religious, moral, or social norms. In Christianity, for example, there has been what you might call an underground belief that once one is saved, one is no longer bound by moral laws which say that believers are saved by the unearned grace of God and not by good works, lest any one should boast, and placed a priority on orthodoxy, right belief, before orthopraxy, right practice. Galatians 3, 23-25 says that the purpose of the law was to lead people to Christ, and once people believe in Christ, they are no longer under the law. Quote, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Vidyavrata, knowledge observance, spell observance, and or consort observance, is treated as essentially equivalent to karyavrata, vrata karya, in both Buddhist and Shaiva sources. In short, in the non-dualist tantric tradition of the Buddhist Mahayoga and Yogini tantras, karyavrata and its equivalents come to encapsulate virtually all those features that have come most strongly to be associated with tantrism in the modern mind. Sex, to be sure, but also eerie places, cemeteries, lonely, fearsome forests, etc., eccentric dress, and eccentric behavior, including the wholesale rejection of the mainstream practices of exoteric Indian religion. This term is very prominent in the later tantric literature, in order to get a handle on this phenomenon, as it recurs throughout the literature, I have examined a set of important esoteric works which treat of this observance. Among prescribed behaviors, that is, something like a doctor's prescription, sex is the one most commonly advocated, followed closely by wandering. Buddha Kapala Tantra dates from the 9th century. The word Kapala means skull bowl. This tantra foregrounds practice with a female consort as characteristic of the karya. One reads further in the Karya Vrata chapter of the La Gonsamsavara Hekruk Abindahana, the practitioner will obtain Siddhi from sexual intercourse, which is to say that the practitioner will obtain power from sexual intercourse. The Havrajra is also quite clear. Taking a girl of the Vajra clan with a pretty face, wide eyes, and the glow of youth, 
with a body dark like a blue lotus, self-initiated and compassionate, employ her in the performance of the practices, karya. In addition to those prescribed in the literature, there are also a variety of specifically proscribed behavior. Most important of these is, in line with the corresponding prescriptions, discriminating with regard to what is edible, inedible, or potable, impotable, and value judgments in general, as well as recitation, japa, meditation, fire rituals, homa, etc. As the Hevajra Tantra counsels the Vratan, don't conceive of desirable and undesirable, or inedible, edible, potable, impotable, appropriate or inappropriate. Christian Wedemeyer's view is that the aim of Buddhist tantric yogins is a non-dual gnosis that sees through and acts without regard for the delusive sense that the constructive categories of conceptual thought are real and objective. This much is clear throughout the literature, which consistently hammers home the theme of non-duality and non-conceptuality. The esoteric community tantra appears to be one of the earliest Buddhist tantras to advocate the practice in a developed form. Significantly, in the opening passage on the karya, the very first descriptive word is born with the aim of non-conceptuality. The same passage ends as well on this note in perfect essay form. That one who is of the non-conceptual mind accomplishes Buddhahood. It lays great stress repeatedly on non-conceptuality. Concepts lead to hell. Non-conceptuality leads to liberation. And this, I put it to you, is as anti-Platonic as you can possibly get. And it is also in tune with something I have emphasized throughout this podcast. Sensuality requires the immediate experience of our senses and or their objects without the intervention of categories. Imagine that someone tells you to close your eyes and hands you something saying that you might enjoy putting it in your mouth. First you feel it, its density, its roughness or lack thereof, its texture. Then you break off a piece and taste it. Your taste buds immediately transmit data to your brain and your brain says it's a piece of chocolate. Much of the time the experience, other than chewing and swallowing, ends there. You have already put the thing you are tasting into a category, into a concept. But what if your mind has been trained or adjusted to be non-conceptual, or simply less conceptual? Then you will have a richer experience, an experience that is unique. If everything, as per Alabadieu, is a multiplicity of multiplicities, so that, in effect, the whole is never complete or static or fixed, it is always morphing, changing, then you train your mind to experience, to savor, to glory in the component parts, which are themselves always changing. Sensuality is about the continuous newness of everything, of everything that we encounter with our senses. Sensuality is in the moment. In this section, I'm going to be quoting and commenting upon an article entitled My Thuna, Eternal Pleasure in Buddhist Tantra, published in the Persian by Quarterly Journal of Religions, 11th Year, Issue 21, Spring and Summer 1969, as translated by me from the original Farsi. The author is Syed Ground, Associate Professor of Religions and Mysticism, Sahid Madani University of Azerbaijan, Tabriz, Iran. And now I turn the floor over to Professor Syed Ground, who states that in Buddhist ritual, Maithuna means eternal pleasure. This is the state of spiritual flourishing at the level devoid of conventional thought and customs, and is the highest Buddhist authority, departing from the realm of change in existence and thus reaching the desired state of perfection. In Buddhism, it is said that attaining Maithuna during rituals and through performing yoga practices, both physical and sexual, 
is a possibility in this world for all human beings, good and bad, superior and inferior. It seems that this conception of infinite bliss is available to all. And here we may intrude by saying how glorious this conception is. But to continue the professor's exegesis. It follows that, in the tantric worldview, man is the foundation of thought, not God. Plus, joyous immortality is realized through the human body in this world, because the body is not a material mass, but a place of worship. It is sacred, and through it man can attain the status of happiness. In addition, this ritual, the ritual of Mythuna, is about eternal pleasure through participation and sharing in the enlightenment of the inner Buddha. The findings of this study show that Mythuna is desirable. It is the ultimate experience of all human beings, what humans consciously or unconsciously seek and are seeking. As a result, Buddhism is one of the first esoteric practices in Eastern thought to promulgate a system. The ancients dealt with spiritual flourishing through a system in which men and women performed secret acts. The Buddhist tradition of Tantra and Mahasuke, or pleasure, is sometimes interpreted as immortal. It has a place in itself, and a special function has been considered for it. Before discussing the main issue in this research, in order to clarify its theoretical foundations, one wants to ask, what is Maithuna, or eternal pleasure, in the Buddhist tradition of Tantra? Is eternal joy and great happiness something of a kind of intellectual or mental perception or state? Or is it something more complete that encompasses all of this? Are immortality and eternal pleasure in this world realized through the body and bodily pleasures or not? It seems that Mythuna is desirable. It is the end of all human beings something that all human beings, consciously or unconsciously, pursue because it affirms rather than denies the original desires of man. In Buddhist thought, salvation means the attainment of eternal pleasure, that is, transcendence. Those are the views stated by Professor Syed Ground, and here he is referring specifically to Tantric Buddhism. Before we move on, I would like to repeat something from the last section which particularly resonates with me. Tantric Buddhism affirms, rather than denies, the original desires of man. In this section, we are going to rely in part on research and analysis by David B. Gray of Santa Clara University which will help us to review again the history of Tantra, specifically as it has existed and been practiced within Buddhism. Tantric Buddhism developed within the larger Mahayana tradition, and it developed gradually, over the course of several centuries beginning no later than the 6th century. By approximately the 7th century, its advocates began to conceive of esoteric Buddhism as a distinct methodology. The method of mantra, mantranaya, distinct from the method of perfections, paramitanaya, of the early Mahayana. By the late 8th century, Indian Buddhist authors began composing a genre of tantric Buddhist scriptures that departed radically from the earlier Buddhist textual models. These texts were known as yogini tantras, which is something we've mentioned before throughout this episode largely on account of their focus on a class of female deities known as yoginis and dakinis. They were an ambiguous group of entities, and were generally seen as horrific quasi-human or non-human beings notorious for their love of human flesh and associated with black magic. However, in this literature, they gained a more positive association as enlightening goddesses, at least for the initiated men brave enough to interact with them. The Yogini Tantras were also infamous for their descriptions of transgressive ritual practices involving violence and sexuality. 
they tended to be less obviously Buddhist in part because of their departure from earlier Buddhist textual models. For these reasons, the Yogini Tantras gave rise to considerable controversy within Buddhist communities. The second and third Yogini Tantras were the Chakra Samvara and the He Vajra Tantras, both of which were composed in approximately the late 8th or early 9th century. Like most tantras, the Chakra Samvara Tantra is not a doctrinal, but a practice-oriented text. We might take as an example the following verse in chapter 13, quote, One should experience everything. We might take as an example of this the following verse in chapter 13, One should experience everything, whatever comes naturally within the path of the sense powers, as being composed of Buddhas, through the yoga of ultimate equipoise. If Buddhism were a theistic religion, a religion where there are one or more gods, one might describe this as an expression of pantheism. When we were looking at the Gospel of Thomas in a previous episode, we found Jesus saying, It is I who am the entirety. It is from me that the entirety has come and to me that the entirety goes. Split a piece of wood, I am there. Lift a stone, and you will find me there. Pantheism. However, back to the Chakra Samvara Tantra. An early 10th century Buddhist commentator commented on this verse's statement that everything is composed of Buddhas as follows. Whatever is explained as referring to all of the realms of the world without exception. Whatever, in quotes, is explained as referring to all of the realms of this world without exception. That which is of the path of the sense powers is analyzed with wisdom by means of both direct perception, pratyaksa, and inference, anumana. Whatever is realized comes naturally through the yoga of ultimate equipoise in this sort of reality or nature, that is, through the application of expedience and wisdom, everything should be experienced as being composed of Buddhas, meaning that all things should be regarded as the reality of the Buddhas. This is because, as was said by the scions of the victor, these three worlds are mind only. Which is to say, everything exists as mind only. Of course, in Buddhist cosmology, the three worlds are earth, atmosphere, and sky. If I may digress for a moment, as is my wont, one of the things that appeals to us most about the development of tantric thinking is that it, in its Trikakaula lineage, is non-dualist, meaning that Tantra held that the mind and the body are one. As Christian Wedemeyer emphasizes, in the non-dualist tantric literature of the Buddhist Mahayoga and Yogini Tantras, Karyavatra and its equivalents come to encapsulate virtually all of these features that have come most commonly to be associated with tantrism in the modern mind, and especially sex. A number of passages in the Chakra Samvara Tantra refer to magical practices. To cite only one example, the 15th century Tibetan commentator Song Kapa understands one rite described in this tantra involving a zombie, Vitala, a corpse in a charnel ground that is reanimated via the insertion of a pill in its mouth. I understand that such pills will shortly be available at CVS and Walgreens. As is the case of other tantras in the unexcelled yoga tantra class, the Chakra Samvara Tantra is understood to require the performance of four rites of consecration. 1. The Vase Consecration 2. Secret Consecration 3. Gnosis of the Consort Consecration and 4. The Fourth Consecration The first of these, the vase consecration, is a multi-step ritual process that includes all of the consecrations developed within the earliest strata of Buddhist Tantra known as the Yoga Tantras. 
The subsequent consecrations developed in the Mahayana and Yogini Tantras from the late 7th century onwards called for the master and adept to sexually unite with a female consort. In the first of these, the secret consecration, the master engages in sexual union with a consort and then places a drop of the mixed sexual fluids produced from this union on the adept's tongue. Next, in the gnosis of the consort consecration, the adept is instructed in sexual union with a consort. This is then followed by the cryptic fourth consecration, which is not mentioned at all in the Chakra Ransamvara Tantra. It is understood by commentators to be the disclosure of the tradition's secret oral traditions to the adept. The sexual practices that the Chakrasamvara Tantra and related literature appear to have inspired considerable controversy. The Chakrasamvara Tantra itself briefly describes the sexual components of the second and third consecrations. Having received consecration, the male adept needs to find a female partner for sexual practices called a messenger, duty. And if I may digress, finding such a duty is no easier today than it was in the 8th or 9th centuries A.D. You know, going on Facebook ain't going to help you guys. No way. The Chakra Samvara Tantra describes in some detail the families, kula, of female practitioners whom the adept must seek out. Over the course of ten chapters, it relates their characteristic appearances so that he can identify them, as well as the physical signs and verbal codes that he must display to correctly identify himself and win their favor. To put it in 21st century terms, the right pickup lines to use. The text also evokes, without providing any detailed descriptions, the sexual practices that he should conduct with her. This is the, quote, great worship of the consort, mudra ma apuja, which involves sexual union for the purpose of producing mixed male and female sexual fluids, which are then consumed by the couple, in order to give rise to magical powers, Sidi, such as flight. Well, as far as Sidi's are concerned, actually there are a whole bunch of them. Since the expression pick-up lines has come up, albeit tangentially, or as a friend of mine would say, tangentially, hmm, let us take a moment to say a little bit about those, and that is specifically to recommend a podcast episode by Anita Di Francesco, our friend, the psychotherapist, and that is specifically on the subject of pickup lines. Refer, please, to her podcast, Discover Joyous Love. And maybe someday, hopefully not too long from now, I will come up with a pickup line that works on her. As promised, here is a brief divigation on the topic of the use of naturally occurring psychotropic plants in Tantra. And here I'm referring to ancient Tantra, primarily. A long time ago, both Datura Stramonium and Datura Metal are well documented in India and Tibet. In Sanskrit, Datura is known as Datura, while in Tibetan, the plant is Da Dura. Datura's effects were described in several Ayurvedic Materia Medica. It is mentioned in the Kama Sutra, 8th to 6th centuries of the Christian era, if fruit be mixed with the fruit of the thorn apple, Datura, it causes intoxication. No kidding. It also advises a man to anoint his penis with honey infused with datura and long peppers, pipali, equals piper lungum, before sexual intercourse to make his partner subject to his will. There is textual evidence that datura's psychoactive effects may have played a part in some tantric rituals. The Mahakala Tantra says that the yogi who applies a datura ointment will revolve like a bee. 
Parts of the Datura plant are referred to in the Chakra Samvara Tantra, discussed earlier in this episode, as the five intoxicants. The Vajra Mahapairava Tantra may be saying that if you put Datura in someone's food, they will go insane. Were psychoactive plants regarded as helpful for achieving liberation? The Tara Tantra seems to say so. The scripture quotes Buddha as saying that wine without cannabis will not produce ecstasy, a key attainment in the technique of subtle energy yoga that it describes. However, the Tara Tantra is a relatively minor scripture and did not exert a strong influence on Buddhist religious culture. In a similar vein, Tantra historian Ronald Davidson notes that the use of datura and tantric rituals may have something to do with the Siddhis' fascination with flying or perhaps inform their iconography. For a common report from the use of datura is a sensation of aerial transport or the feeling of being half man and half animal. The Mahakala Tantra also offers instructions on how to find lost treasure by creating a magical pill that includes datura. After having ground the following medicines, one should make pills, the seed grain of Kaloya, the seed of Sasbania, the juice of the leaf of the waved leaf fig tree, the juice of Yarsia cristata, the juice of Yarsia cristata, the power of the regurgitation of a cow, the juice of Siva's intoxicant, that is to say datura, the juice of the root of the worm seed and onion leaf together with the bile of a snake and honey which has been kept under the ground. When two days have gone by, at a cool time of the day, one should anoint the eyes and one will see a hole in the ground. All of that so you can see a hole in the ground? Get a job as a grave digger and you can see a hole in the ground for nothing. But seriously, when explore ecstatic sensuality, goes into the supplements business, this will surely be one of our offerings. Sonia Gomez, Ph.D., is CEO and owner of Spaso Zen Wellness Centers in Portugal. She is also international advisor to Lotus Heart in Nepal, working on women's health issues and female empowerment for Buddhist nuns in the Himalayas. I'm going to take a few moments to share some of her views. From the point of view of sacred outlook, women are the embodiment of the principle of emptiness, as we have discussed previously in this episode. Taking the form at face value in a substantial way causes the observer to miss the essential nature of the form. That is why the dakini is a symbol. When we see the symbolic nature of the Dakini, there is fresh insight about the nature of all phenomena. For these reasons, Dr. Gomez speaks of the feminine, not of the female. When Dakinis are spoken of as female, mistakes can be made in interpretation. Beauty, harmony, health, self-confidence, wisdom, personal development, complete happiness, Perfection, overwhelming fulfillment, great success in all aspects of life, wonderful couple relationships, etc., are all accomplished naturally on the way of becoming a perfect woman, or in tantric words, a dakini, or genuine manifestation of shakti. Dakinis can be translated as women who dance in space or women who revel in the freedom of emptiness. Dr. Gomez argues and presents evidence to the effect that women and men were partners in the creation of the Tantras. As for women being the embodiment of the principle of emptiness, it is perhaps notable that Sigmund Freud was critical of his otherwise faithful disciple, and we should add, originator of key concepts in his thought, Lou Andreas Salome's attraction to Buddhism and what he regarded as her, quote, neurotic tendency to move toward a chimeric void, unquote. But take another look. Freud actually has a great insight, including how the resonance of emptiness can bring 
Well, let's quote from a letter from Freud to Lou Andreas Salome. I strike up a, mostly very simple, melody. You supply the higher octaves for it. I separate the one from the other, and you blend what has been separated into a higher unity. I silently accept the limits imposed by our subjectivity, whereas you draw express attention to them. So, feminine Dakini emptiness can resonate in higher octaves, can find new levels over and above the simple thoughts of man, the simple melodies which man devises in his mind, with no consciousness of the higher octaves, the higher vibrations above it. Perhaps the foremost female Buddha is Vajra Yogini. Vajra Rogini is often described with the epithet Sarva Buddha Dakini, meaning the Dakini who is the essence of all Buddhas. According to scholar Miranda Shaw, Vajra Rogini is, quote, inarguably the supreme deity of the Tantric pantheon. She is beautiful passionate and untamed. The identification of human women and goddesses is often voiced by a female deity. For instance, the Vajra Yogini repeatedly states that she reveals herself in and through women, wherever in the world a female body is seen. That should be recognized as my holy body. While a woman's relationship with Vajra Yogini is one of identity, for a man it is primarily one of devotion that he must extend to women as her living representatives. To quote from the Shakti Sangama Tantra, Woman is the creator of the universe. The universe is her form. Woman is the foundation of the world. There is not, nor has been, nor will be, any yoga to compare with a woman. No mystical formula nor asceticism to match a woman. When I interviewed leading Tantra and Tantric Yoga authority Anita Di Francesco for one of the episodes we did on Tantra, Anita talked about how men should worship women, and when she asked me if I worshipped her, I said yes. Both as it was practiced a thousand years ago and more in India, and more recently in Tibet, June Campbell studied Tibetan Buddhism in monasteries in India in the early 1970s. Subsequently, she traveled throughout India, Europe, and North America as a translator and interpreter for various Tibetan lamas. In 1996, she was interviewed by Tricycle magazine. The interviewer asked her about tantric visualization practices, which were an effort in late tantric Buddhism, and by late we mean approximately a thousand years ago, to redact actual sexual elements as described in the Chakra Samvara Tantra just mentioned, and also the renowned Guya Samaja Tantra, and replace them with visualizations. In other words, no one needed to actually have sex, The Maithuna ritual was removed, and instead they could, if you will, get where they wanted to go by imagining having sex. The interviewer asked, Are the benefits of tantric visualization practices considered parallel to actual sexual engagement? June Campbell replied, No, they may be represented that way in text, but in the functioning of the system, To have an actual sexual consort is considered the most important ingredient in the path of Tantra. That's where so much of the confusion and ambivalence and misogyny come into play, because you have both the emphasis on male monastic society and at the same time the need for women, but without the acknowledgement of the role women play. The centrality of the hidden sexual relationship is terribly important. In this same interview, Campbell goes on to discuss at length her sexual relationship with the late Kalu Rinpoche, a great Tibetan teacher who was presented to the world as a celibate yogi. In the course of that relationship, to paraphrase her, 
she began to feel exploited. I have myself heard stories about women who either got caught up in this sort of situation or else bailed when they understood that having sex with a yogi or master was something which would be expected of them. I heard a story once about a woman who was literally standing outside a closed door with a group of other devotees observing her. Suddenly it became readily apparent to her that once she opened the door and closed it behind her, she would be expected to engage in sexual activities with the yogi or master. At that point she left, but how many women in a similar position have not? Just in passing, I have never heard a story of a male waiting outside of a closed door on the other side of which there was a woman with whom he would be expected to have sex. In my opinion, that would be far more interesting. As far as sex is concerned, women are, or should be, the great teachers. As mentioned elsewhere in this episode, men feel, feel in their id, in their unconscious, in what they desperately attempt to construct as their masculinity, that heights of ecstasy are possible, achievable, and available for women far beyond what is possible, available, and achievable for men. And again, to return to an overarching theme of this podcast, this is a source of misogyny. The idea of penis envy was projected onto women by men, first articulated by Freud, merely because Freud could not face his own envy of the female orgasm, of the female orgasm's exponential splendor, as compared to anything ever experienced by a man. Jacques Lacan, as one might have expected, had something interesting to say on the subject. For Lacan, the penis, what he referred to as the phallus, is the privileged signifier of humanity's subordination to language, the phallus by virtue of which the unconscious is language. Of course, this opened Lacan up for accusations of misogyny. But what was he really saying? That the phallus subjects people to the tyranny of language, even in the unconscious. Since yoga is a term and a subject which recurs throughout this presentation, I would here like to insert a brief divagation specifically regarding it. Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, which may date from as early as 200 BC to as late as 500 AD, are often cited as a foundational text about yoga and yoga practices. However, as we have mentioned elsewhere, and this is something which bears repeating, one finds little of yogic practice in the sense of techniques involving fixed postures, asanas, and breath control, pranayama, in the Yoga Sutra. References to the subtle body, the channels, nadis, and energy centers, chakras, are entirely absent from this work. Prior to the 12th century, the term yogin, or yogesvara, master of yoga, like the feminine yogini, or yogesvari, most often meant sorcerer or magician. Tantra had come along and embraced Patanjali's work, but rejected its mind-body dualism, and sometimes, in its antinomian variants, it had also even rejected Patanjali's good-bad dualism. Needless to say, yoga is flourishing today in many forms, including multiple practices of tantric yoga. On this topic, I urge you to consult with a leading authority, Anita Di Francesco, you should visit her website at www.tantrawisdom.com and also her Tantra Wisdom and Love and Relationship Coach business pages on Facebook. For the moment, I would like to call your attention to a recent study on the benefits of yoga, and by this we are referring to the yoga asanas as practiced today on women's sexual health, pleasure, and satisfaction. To sum up some of the results of this study, 72.5% of the participants experienced greater satisfaction in their sexual life following yoga. Equally or more interesting is the finding that scores on emotional closeness during sexual activity increased significantly 
With the probability that this result is random and not the result of actual cause and effect being 0, 0. 0.0003. The smaller the p-value, the greater the likelihood that this is a genuine correlation. Improvement in all of the dimensions studied was greater among women with a mean age of 50 than it was among women with a mean age of 32. Overall orgasmic quality improved for over half the women in this study. Orgasmic quality improved maximally in younger women, followed closely by satisfaction. It is apparent that arousal was the major form of improvement in women above age 45, which was more than in younger women. It occurs to us here at Explore Ecstatic Sensuality that these results might constitute an excellent sales pitch for anyone teaching yoga. We are going to close this episode by talking about the concept of God in Buddhism. One often encounters small or large statues or other images of the Buddha in people's homes and in other environments. There are, in fact, those who meditate in the presence of these statues or images. It seems to assist in their meditation practice and their focus practice. The absence of veneration of images is known as anikonism. There was an ancient prohibition against showing the Buddha himself. In fact, until the first century AD, the Buddha was represented only as an empty throne or a riderless horse floating in space. Despite veneration, what some would go so far as to call worship of the Buddha and images of him, Buddhism roundly rejects any notion that the Buddha was God. Beyond that, the renowned and trusted source, Wikipedia, tells us that there was no creator God in Buddhism. Well, dear listener, that view calls for certain modifications. The concept of a mythic creator god is well documented in later Hinduism when the popular gods such as Vishnu, Shiva, and Devi became predominant. But it seems to be difficult to trace such a concept at the time of the historical Buddha. Regardless of the situation, the Buddhist texts argue against the inconsistency of such a mythic creator. This attitude resulted in the assumption that Buddhists deny God in general without ever bothering to define the exceedingly ambiguous word God. Buddhist thinkers continued throughout history to point to the incompatibility of the vision of a mythic divine craftsman who manufactures the world and the philosophical claim that God is the totally other who, beyond the limitations of space and time, is the absolute source and origin of the universe, but not its causal beginning. So, what is the causal beginning of the universe? Listen further, my dear friend. When Buddhism first came to be known in the West, many scholars and philosophers were surprised to encounter, for the first time, a non-theistic religion, a phenomenon which seemed to entail a self-contradiction. Arthur Schopenhauer said, Through the agreement of all genuine testimonies and original documents, it is put beyond all doubt that Buddhism, the religion that is the foremost on earth by virtue of the overwhelming number of its adherents, is absolutely and expressly atheistic. The Kun Bied Rigal Poi Mindo, hereafter KBG, has not so far been studied by any modern scholar until such study was ventured by Eva Key Dargay, whose research and analysis is the basis of some of the material contained in the present section of this episode. Eva K. Dargay, also known as Eva K. Neumeyer Dargay, is professor of Eastern religions at the University of Calgary. She is the author of three books, including the first German translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. KBG is a Buddhist canonical text and included in all conjure editions as well as in two collections of tantras, the NGB and the VGB. The KGB has several titles in these collections, the All-Creating King, i.e. Bodhisattva, 
and the great perfection of all phenomena, and a tantra free from segregations like the sky, a scripture in 84 chapters of utmost secrecy, the essence of the sky. Wonderful titles. In the modern conjure editions, the KBG is part of the Ring Rigud, Old Tantras, section, which contains those tantras which were translated into Tibetan during the first period of dissemination of Buddhism, which is to say, in the 7th through the 9th centuries. As a common practice, all Buddhist scriptures began by describing the situation where and when the Buddha taught the doctrine and to whom. The tantras, however, introduced the reader into a world of complex symbolism. The Hevajra Tantra, for example, starts, Thus I have heard, at one time the Lord dwelt in bliss with the Vajra Yogini, who is the body, speech, and mind of all the Buddhas. There the Lord pronounces these words. But wait a minute. At the very beginning, the Lord dwelt in bliss with a female Buddha and Dakini. Vajra Yogini is often described with the epithet Sarva Buddha Dakini, meaning the Dakini who is the essence of all Buddhas. She is a meditation deity, and her practice includes methods for preventing ordinary death, intermediate state, bardo, and rebirth, samsara. Another famous tantra, the Guya Samaja Tantra, starts with almost identical words. Thus I have heard, at one time the exalted one dwelt in the womb of the female diamond, who is the body, speech, mind, and heart of all Buddhas. So here once again we see the description of femininity as the body, speech, mind, and heart of all Buddhas. In most tantras, the Buddha enters into a discourse with either his female consort or with Vajratsattva, who submits his questions to the Buddha. The KBG tantra, however, starts in a different way. For the sake of time, I am only going to read a few sections of this. At a place of no beneath in the space of reality as such, in the sphere of facticity, at the center of mind itself, in the mansion of undefiled wisdom, at a time when he gave that sermon, there was his entourage revealing his nature, his identity, his compassion, and wisdom. The concept of entourage continues throughout this introduction to the KBG. To continue, there are entourages of his Nirman Akaya, revealing his compassion and wisdom. The entourage called, quote, the creatures of the world of desires, the entourage called, quote, the creatures of the world of forms, the entourage called, quote, the creatures of the world of formlessness, these are his entourages visualizing his nature, i.e. the four aspects of yoga. The entourage called Ati Yoga, the entourage called Pari Yoga, Sikh, the entourage called Maha Yoga, the entourage called the Yoga of Creatures. They are one, since his nature, his identity, and the character of his compassion are inseparable. Furthermore, there are the entourages that understand his nature, the entourage residing in him, i.e., the previous and now past Buddhas, the entourage realizing his intention, i.e., the now existent Buddhas, and the entourage emerging from him, i.e., the Buddhas to come in the future. They are one as his nature is inseparable. It is useful to insert here that Ati Yoga is a yoga aimed at discovering and continuing the ultimate ground of existence. Pari Yoga is a very strange word here. In other contexts, it means to mix or blend. And Maha Yoga is held to emphasize the generation stage or development stage of Tantra, where the succeeding two, Anu Yoga and Ati Yoga, emphasize the completion stage in the synthesis or transcendence of the two. In this passage in the KBG, 
the all-creator king's entourage consists of the three kajas, i.e. the three levels of Buddha's being. His existence in time and space, through which the Buddha manifests in the human world, consists in entourages which equal the three realms of the universe, the world of formlessness, the world of forms, and the world of desires. In other words, the nature of the all-creating king is manifested in the noetic as well as in the physical structure of the world. The text, ex the text assures its reader that the entourage and the all-creating king are one, as there is no difference with regard to their nature or identity. In general, the Buddha's entourage consists of beings who are different from his own person as long as we stay in the realm of conventional truth. The KBG, however, places the action in the introduction in the realm of absolute or utmost reality, where everything coincides with voidness, sunyata, which is the essence of the Buddha. On the subject of the void, as we have mentioned previously, contemporary French philosopher Alain Badiou places it within his system in an interesting way. For Badiou, being qua being consists in infinitely ramifying multiples of multiples, all woven from the originary inconsistency of the void. Subjectivity originates in the event as the interruption of consistency, through which the void's inconsistency is summoned to the surface of a situation. If both void and infinitely multiple, and if the dice throws are ontologically distinct, then it can only be because each throw indexes a distinct quantification of the infinite, a distinct quantification of the void as infinitely multiple, describing the event's invocation of the void. Badiou writes, because the void of being only comes to the surface of a situation in the guise of an event, chance is the material of truth. I repeat, chance is the material of truth. Although mathematically configured in every event as a distinct quantification of its infinite emptiness, the void can never surface as such. It can never occur, never take place, for it is nothing but an empty name devoid of reference, a letter that fails to designate, a sign without a concept. But back to our tantric text, the KBG, it goes on to explain how the world emanates from the All-Creator King. Quote, then, with regard to his nature, his identity, his compassion, Bodhisattva, the all-creating king, established all phenomena in the following way. Out of the sole great wisdom originating from him spontaneously, the five great spontaneous wisdoms emanate. They are the great spontaneous wisdom of hatred, the great spontaneous wisdom of passion, the great spontaneous wisdom of ignorance, of jealousy, of arrogance, out of these five great spontaneous wisdoms, the five great visible causes emanate. They constitute the three realms of the impermanent world. If one summarizes the external appearance of the five visible causes, then it is as follows. There is an appearance called earth, an appearance of visible causes. There is an appearance called water, an appearance of visible causes. There is an appearance called fire, an appearance of visible causes. There is an appearance called wind, an appearance of visible causes. There is the appearance called space, an appearance of visible causes. Condensed in a single appearance, they will unfold into the various categories of the five wisdoms. That is to say, the spontaneous wisdoms of the category hatred, passion, ignorance, jealousy, and arrogance. When the various categories of the five spontaneous wisdoms appear, the reality as such is established in correlation with the appearance of the visible causes. After having established reality as such, i.e., his nature, Bodhisattva, the all-creating king, dwells in that way. 
This passage states that from the all-creating king, the four elements and the five spontaneous wisdoms, which are cognitive categories in tantric Buddhism, in order to understand reality, emanate. In interpreting this passage from the KBG, the all-creating king may be conceived as the ontological ground, while the five spontaneous wisdoms, as well as the physical world, i.e. the four elements, are the phenomena emanating from it. In the primary nature of the ontological ground, i.e. the all-creating king, rests the entirety of the phenomenal world. His nature is of spontaneous wisdom unfolding into the five aspects which are classified as defilements by the common Buddhist tradition, hatred, passion, ignorance, jealousy, and arrogance. However, these defilements provide the seedbed for all forces of vitality. All facets of man's entangling encounter with life emanate from this ground. The external physical world is established by the all-creating king as well. This text emphasizes the various ways through which the great wisdom becomes manifest in the elements which constitute the three realms of the universe, the realm of passion, the realm of form, and the realm of formlessness. Here is another fascinating statement contained in the KBG. Although virtuous and wrong deeds are different, they both demonstrate my sincere, unfailing compassion. To those who adhere to a system of causality, I do not reveal the teachings that I am the all-creating God. Even if I were to reveal this teaching to them definitively, they would still claim that virtuous and wrong deeds have their causes and results. Consequently, they would subject me, the wholly pure, to their praise and blame, and for a long time they would be unable to find me, the wholly pure. I am the teacher, the all-creating one, Bodhisattva, and it is Bodhisattva that is the all-creating king. Unquote. This passage explains well the fact that the ontological ground is imminent and transcendent at once, at the same time. Although the primary one is reflected in the phenomenal world, it transcends the world of perception. Its general purity is never affected by ethical categories. In order to substantiate this claim, the text has to discard the doctrine of causality, commonly thought to be one of the cornerstones of Buddhist philosophy. Certainly in early Buddhism, the concept of causality was conducive to the no-self theory and the soteriological path as the traditional Buddhists conceived it. But, when Narayajuna revised the entire problem of causality, it became clear that the concept of a lineal causality is inconsistent in itself. He replaced the concept of a lineal causality with that of a situational causality. The KBG takes us one step further in abolishing the theory of causality in total. However, recall that karma is the basis of what one might call Buddhist ethics. Karma is the causality principle, focusing on one causes, two actions, and three effects where it is the mind's phenomena that guide the actions that the actor performs. Buddhism trains the actor's actions for continued and uncontrived virtuous outcomes aimed at reducing suffering. So, it is especially interesting that this tantric text explicitly dispenses with the notion of cause and effect. A long time ago, philosopher David Hume argued that our notion of causality must largely be derived from our individual experiences rather than, one might say, theoretically. In the present era, quantum physics has had a few run-ins with the concept of causality. It has been suggested that a classical notion of causal structure is untenable in any framework compatible with the basic principles of quantum mechanics and classical general relativity. One has to be careful in the use of the word cause in physics. Properly speaking, the hypothesized cause and the hypothesized effect are each temporally transient processes. 
For example, force is a useful concept for the explanation of acceleration, but force is not by itself a cause. More is needed. For example, a temporally transient process might be characterized by a definite change of force at a definite time. Such a process can be regarded as a cause. Causality is not inherently implied in equations of motion, but postulated as an individual constraint that needs to be satisfied, i.e., a cause always precedes its effect. More is needed. For example, a temporally transient process might be characterized by a definite change of force at a definite time a characterization. Such a process can be regarded as, quote, a cause, unquote. However, causality is not inherently implied in equations of motions, but postulated as an additional constraint that needs to be satisfied, i.e., a cause always precedes its effect. Well, One might venture that for species endowed with consciousness, causal relationships may be mere appearances, and as such, convenient illusions. Which brings us back once again to David Hume's illusory theory. Hume scholars agree that Hume regards the ascription of invariance or uninterruptibleness to objects as a fiction and an error. There is some question as to whether Hume's view of personal identity is skeptical or not. But, at any rate, Hume's theory of personal identity is fundamentally negative. Hume regards the ascription of identity to changing or interrupted objects, including persons, as erroneous. So not only causal relationships, but also even the perception of identity or consistency, including in a person, are psychological quote-unquote, on an individual basis. And in fact, each of us consists of a number of personalities, none of which is static. One might say definable or localizable. Back to Hume again. And this makes sense because nothing about ourselves is permanent, even on the simple level of information. We constantly acquire new information while old information is filed away or lost. It is not as if we can get a new nifty 50 terabyte hard drive every time our brain runs out of space. And also, our sensory inputs change over time on both a long and short-term basis. Drugs, even strong coffee, and certainly a margarita or two, and even most certainly cannabis, or detura, as mentioned earlier, alter our sensory inputs, and therefore, what information is available to us. However, back one more time to our tantric KBG. Quote, My nature is bodhicitta. My sheer nature shows itself as pure. My nature shows itself as mind, as it is the infinite and absolute all-creating king. Who else, if not the mind of pure perfection, would create the entirety? In this passage, the term bodhisattva, which means in its Tibetan translation, mind of pure perfection, is not understood in terms of soteriological altruism, but rather as the authentic nature of mind as such. Therefore, the nature of mind as such, or the pure mind, is said to be inseparable and indistinguishable from reality as such. On the other hand, It is only when the mind departs from its sheer nature and manifests itself in various activities that the world of sensuous perception can arise. For this reason, one might well say that from the individual's viewpoint, the mind is the creator of the world. The question arises whether the ultimate, when revealing itself to the mystic in the blissful unio mystica, can be experienced only in a personal way. Just the briefest of asides to inquire whether if this is the case, then what results is not something akin to solipsism. If the ultimate, including the world in which we live, can only be experienced in a personal way, then how can one individual possibly have any unity of experience with any other? 
and certainly, how can anything religious or spiritual, in either the narrowest or the broadest sense of those words, have any group or societal context? However, let's return to our main train of thought. Since the very first episode of this podcast series, I have argued against mind-body dualism and the consequent devalorization of the physical world, which flowed from the writings of René Descartes, but which actually goes back all the way to Plato, or Parmenides, if you want to trace it that far back. This is one of the things that, to put it crudely, turned me off to Buddhism. However, here we have an, albeit obscure, tantric text which presents matters quite differently. Here, pure mind is said to be indistinguishable from reality itself. Could one argue that in this tantric text, the All-Creator King is telling us not only to dispense with causality, with cause and effect, but also with mind-body dualism, or the difference between pure mind and the physical world in which we live? Before we move on, I would like to return once more to the notion of karma. If we, as per Hume, and also in a certain way per this tantric text, are so, if you will, inconsistent, and if there is no causality, and this text states this explicitly, how can there be such a thing as karma? In casual conversation, people will say of a person's actions, that's bad karma. Karma is a Sanskrit term that literally means action or doing. In the Buddhist tradition, karma refers to action driven by intention which leads to future consequences. Those intentions are considered to be determining factors in the kind of rebirth in samsara, the cycle of birth, which we have to look forward to. Tantra, interestingly enough, uses karma mudra, meaning action seal, to transform what could tie a practitioner to samsara, the cycle of rebirth, into a spiritually liberative practice. Judith Simmer Brown, Distinguished Professor of Contemplative and Religious Studies Emeritus at Naropa University, explains how karma mudra can be used to explore the nature of passion. According to her, there are traditionally three ways to realize the nature of passion in the yogic tradition of Tantra. First, in the creation phase practice, one can visualize the yidams and yabyum in sexual union. Second, one can practice tumo, kandali, or the generation of internal heat through the subtle body experiences of the vital breath moving into the central channel. Third, one can practice so-called sexual yoga, karma mudra, leiki chagya, with a consort. Realizing the true nature of passion in all of these forms transforms ordinary passion into the basis for the experience of great bliss, Mahasuka, which greatly accelerates the removal of emotional and mental obscurations in one's practice. So, just to back up a bit, sexual yoga, karma mudra, lekichagya, can greatly accelerate the removal of emotional and mental obscurations in one's practice. Early masters of the six yogas of Naropa placed great emphasis on karma mudra practice, with some giving it separate status as one of the six yogas, while others saw it as an aspect of the inner heat yoga. While many of the traditional lists of types of consorts to seek out for joint practice to gain spiritual attainments are written for males and from a male point of view, there are some rare instructions for these sadhanas and for consort choice from the point of view of female practitioners. In other words, there are tantric texts whose purpose is to instruct women in what sort of men they should seek out for joint practice of karma mudra. I plan to include these instructions for women in a future episode of Explore Ecstatic Sensuality. I think all women following this podcast would be extremely interested in knowing what men they should seek out for this great purpose. In his exhaustive book, Tibetan Yoga and Mysticism, a textual study of the yogas of Navropa and Mahamudra meditation in the medieval tradition of Dagspo, published in 2015, Ulrich Timakrag translates for us Gampopa's A Mirror Illuminating the Oral Tradition, which describes, very precisely and in detail, 
the male yogi's karma mudra practice. One would very much like to find a description of the male yogi's female consort's karma mudra practice during sex. We will most certainly present such a description in a future episode of this podcast series, Explore Ecstatic Sensuality. Meanwhile, we are going to give Ulrich Timakrag the floor to tell us one more time about the Kama Mudra. In the Tantric teachings, Maha Mudra designates the meditative practices and experiences associated with the final empowerment of the unparalleled Yoga Tantra, in Sanskrit called Anuttara Yoga Tantra or Yogani Root Tara Tantra. The basis of Mahamudra is a certain theory, understanding, outlook, or view, itabha, of the nature of the mind. One aspect of this is that one's co-emergent perceptions never stop being co-emergent mind as such. Here I see another welcome example of the absence of mind-body dualism in Tantra. Although Mahamudra is frequently referred to as a theory or view, The word view does here not imply a belief. A belief is a concept or a conceptual entanglement, while the co-emergent is said to be free from conceptual entanglements. Being free from conceptual entanglements is also the definition given to emptiness by the Indian Madhyamaka philosophers, and the co-emergent should therefore be understood as being empty. According to Beskampa Legsmedzes, quote, by severing beliefs, reality is established as being free from all conceptual entanglements. Its nature is therefore uncontrived by thought. As long as one contrives, one does not realize the true nature of the observer and the perception. The nature of reality is impenetrable by thought. Thus, Dharmakaya is precisely the uncontrived awareness of freedom from all conceptual entanglements. In our view, this uncontrived nature of thought and awareness is not so much for the purpose of attaining a blank meditative state as it is for experiencing the world, the perceived world, directly, sensually. It is interesting to note that emptiness, sunyata, means the pacification of all conceptual entanglement. According to Khandra Nirti's Madhyamaka Riti Prasannapada, emptiness is called nirvana. What flashes into our mind here is something we discussed earlier, namely Jacques Lacan's statement that women do not lend themselves to generalization, do not lend themselves to categorization, or, to put it differently, to conceptualization. Based on his extensive study of the Tantras, Mirkea Eliade concluded that girl, woman, is emptiness. Following the logic of this, woman is nirvana. The Indian term Mahamudra is a Sanskrit compound consisting of two words, the adjective maha, meaning great or big, and the noun mudra, meaning seal, stamp, or impression. Used metaphorically, the Sanskrit word mudra denotes a variety of symbols, especially symbolic hand gestures employed in Indian dance and religious ritual and iconography. The Indian Buddhist tantras operate with a large number of mudras, and the term mahamudra must therefore be seen in its tantric context as being a subtype of the broader term mudra. In the unparalleled yoga tantras, Anuttara Yoga Tantra, in this context, the word mudra carries a special meaning in the tantric practices in the Anuttara Yoga Tantras, wherein orgasm is employed as a special sexual approach for experiencing the meditative unraveling of thought. Such unraveling of thought is called emptiness, sunyata, or radiance, prabhasvara, or abhasvara, in the tantric terminology. The basic theory is that an unraveling of thought occurs naturally during orgasm, 
and through yogic control of the sexual experience, it may become possible to remain in an intense, prolonged experience of orgasm-like bliss that reaches beyond ordinary concepts and thereby shatters the mind's usual entanglement in conceptuality. The tantric practitioner is then supposed to utilize this experience of sexual ecstasy for the spiritual purpose of realizing non-conceptuality, nirvikalpa. The sexual practices of Anuttara Yoga Tantras involve a constellation of three or four so-called mudras or seals. These are named the Dharma Seal, Choski Pyagyag, Dharma Mudra, the Knowledge Seal, Yeshaski Pyagya, Inyana Mudra, the Action Seal, Laski Pyagya, Karma Mudra, and the Great Seal, Pyagya Chenpo Mahamudra. Basically, all four mudras are representations or symbols of readiness and emptiness, namely, the object of realization in Buddhist tantric practice. Emptiness is first expressed in the form of the teacher's oral instruction to the practitioner, which is referred to as the Dharma seal. Thereupon, to cultivate the slight experience of emptiness that naturally occurs during the height of sexual arousal and orgasm, the tantric practitioner visualizes him or herself as a male deity in sexual union with a female deity. Here, the female deity represents emptiness and this imagined sexual partner is called the knowledge seal. Having mastered the visualized technique while practicing alone, very advanced practitioners may go on to engage in sexual union with an actual partner in order to enhance the attained meditative experience, and this physical sexual partner, which is generally considered to be a female partner since Buddhist tantric texts almost invariably are written from a male perspective, is called the action seal. Through prolonged sexual union, the practitioner may experience a partial glimpse of awakening, which is called indicatory knowledge. The indicatory knowledge enables the practitioner to progress to the final stage of the tantric practice, which is related to the fourth empowerment of Anuttara Yoga Tantras, during which actual knowledge emerges. It is such actual knowledge of emptiness or radiance that is referred to with the term the Great Seal, which is to say Mahamudra. Mahamudra is thus the ultimate symbol that does not point to awakening, but which rather is awakening itself. In this connection, David B. Gray, whose work we have discussed earlier, has translated the word mudra simply as consort, and has accordingly rendered Mahamudra as the great consort. Such a translation seems to be quite suitable for the context. It is of interest to note that in the text known as Dagspo Ibakabum Corpus, the remedy against sexual desire is meditation on unattractiveness. Who knew? As promised previously in an upcoming series of episodes dedicated to helping unattractive people who have a difficult time getting laid, we will teach our listeners how to pretend to be attracted to unattractive people. How unattractive men can pretend to be attracted to unattractive women, and how unattractive women can pretend to be attracted to unattractive men. We are currently in the pre-development phase of a series of instructional DVDs encompassing the wisdom to be contained in this course. So I hope you've had a good time with this brief episode on the subject of sexual rights in ancient Tantra, the role of women in Tantra, and the concept of the creator God in Buddhism. See you next time. Bye. I would like to take a moment to say something about the person who inspired this podcast and to highly recommend the books she's written and also her professional services. Her name is Anita Di Francesco. She is a psychotherapist. She is a very experienced and professional relationship counselor. She has two wonderful podcasts, 
It's Your Voice! Exclamation point. And that continues on with a new podcast called Discover Joyous Love, on which I've also been a guest. It was a wonderful experience, as it always is, communicating with Anita. So check out her podcast. Her books are extraordinary. One is called Live Free, Recreate and Liberate Your Life, the best book title I could possibly think of, a classic title for a book, in which she really takes you through things you can do to make major changes in elevating your self-love, self-esteem, happiness, and even to help you sexually to find a greater sexual fulfillment and vitality. And her other book, different but also relevant, is a true crime thriller, The Donna Gentili Story, which concerns the brutal murder of her first cousin, Donna Gentili, and her, that is Anita's, personal efforts to identify the killer. Two great books available on Amazon, or check out Anita's own website, tantrawisdom.com. You can find her there and also on her Facebook pages, which are Love and Relationship Coach, and also her business page, Tantra Wisdom. Thanks for checking her out. You won't be disappointed.